So we've seen how we could implement a transmitter and a detector in optics. And now we're going to see the mathematics behind this detection and how is it that this structure, particularly for the coherent receiver, how is it that that gives me access to both phase and amplitude? And again, I refer you to the tutorial paper that I uh, draw on heavily. So I've shown you before this structure for the coherent receiver. I highlighted for you that this local oscillator is beating against the signal. Because of this beating, what we see at this first photodetector is going to be the sum, as I see here, the sum of the uh, data signal and the local oscillator. And what we're going to see in the lower photodiode is incident on that photodiode an electric field which is proportional to the difference between the two. So this is where we're taking advantage of the phase shift, which occurs in the 3dB 2 by 2 coupler. So keeping this in mind, that what's occurring at E1 and E2 at each one of these photodiodes, one is the sum, one is the difference, and this is because it is beating against it. Uh, then the next step is, what is going on at this photodiode? So if I look at the photodiode here, it's a square law detector, right? So I'm going to take this E1, which is incident, and I'm going to square it. And I take the first term, which is the signal, and I'm going to get something that's proportional to the signal squared, to the power of the signal. I'm going to get something that's proportional to the square of the local oscillator, um, the, the modulus squared of the local oscillator uh, electric field. And of course, that is the power of the uh, local oscillator. And then I'm going to get a cross term. I'm going to get the inner product of these two electric fields, which are incident on the uh, photodiode. This is the beat term. This is the term which is proportional to the cosine of the phase between them. It's also proportional to the modulus of the signal and the local oscillator. So this is the magic term. This is the term, the beating, that's going to let us have access to the phase of the signal. So let's give some names to this. Let's call theta of sig signal to be the signal phase and theta L to be the local oscillator's phase. And somehow the difference between these two is the cosine of this difference is what is happening in this term of where I'm focusing my interest. So I'm going to have one part of the photocurrent, which is coming out of this first photodiode, which is proportional to the sum of the powers of the signal and the local oscillator, the DC part of the, the signal coming out. And the important part is, of course, this beat term. And I'm going to have something that is uh, looks like this term. Again, I'm going to have the square root of the powers, the product of the powers of the signal and the local oscillator, and have the cosine. And of course, this difference in phase between the local oscillator and the signal, it could have some intermediate frequency. The, the two lasers might not be exactly on the same wavelength. And depending on what that difference in wavelength is, I'm going to have some intermediate frequency that's coming there. Then of course, after the intermediate frequency, I've got the phase of the signal and the phase of the local oscillator. And uh, due to the square law of detection, the inner product, it's the difference between these phases that I'm going to see, just like it's the difference between the, the um, uh, frequencies that I saw. So let's simplify our thinking, OK? So let's just suppose that we actually have a local oscillator, which is exactly aligned with the wavelength of the signal. Of course, in practice, this wouldn't be exactly so, but in digital signal processing, we're going to be able to take care of any difference. So uh, we're going to neglect that for now. Sometimes we call that the homodyne case. Uh, so for instance, if you're doing an experiment in the lab and you're using the same source for both, then they could be very, very close indeed. So in this case, in the homodyne case, we don't have an intermediate frequency, and it really is the difference in phase between these two. Now I'm going to make another simplifying assumption. Again, it doesn't really change much. It just lets me get to the concepts and makes it a little cleaner to understand what's going on. Uh, 
So the second simplifying assumption is that this local oscillator phase is actually very small. So that means that we have a very high quality laser, very low line width, and so I can forget about it. Once again, if this is not truly the case, we'll be taking care of that digital signal processing to make it effectively like this. So for now, I'm just going to assume that that uh, is, is, is small enough to neglect. So now, this important part, this beat term, the cross term that's inside of the uh, photocurrent on the upper photodiode is proportional to the cosine of the signal phase. And that's where I'm putting my data. I'm using QPSK. There's four possible phases. And I'm going to be able to see what phase I'm receiving so that I can identify which one of those symbols was actually transmitted. So in this case, this was the result that we got with all these simplifying assumptions on what's going on in the upper part, then the, the first photodiode in the balanced photo uh, detector. And in this case, the second one, I2, because of that 180 degree phase shift, it's the difference between the two electric fields instead of the sum, and because of that, the sign on the cross term has changed. So now there's a negative sign in front of this, but otherwise it's the same term. So now I use the fact that I have this balanced photodiode where the final output photocurrent is proportional to the difference between I1 and I2. And so now when I form what is the difference, this cross terms, these two cross terms are going to combine and I'm going to get something, again, proportional to the cosine of the signal phase. So one other thing I'll observe using this balanced photodiode is that the DC terms are identical in the first photodiode and the second photodiode. So when I do the, the difference between these two, this DC term just disappears. And the only thing left in my output photocurrent for the differential signal is something that's proportional to the cosine of the signal phase. Now, another very important characteristic of coherent, uh, coherent detection is this term here, where I have multiplying my data signal, I have the power of the local oscillator. This means that in coherent detection, I I require a local oscillator. That makes it more complex. Oh, but right away I get bang for my buck. Right away I get gain from having that local oscillator present at the receiver. And so this provides much greater sensitivity in the detection of my signal. So, so far I've been talking about one branch. <laughs> this has always been for the cosine signal. And of course, I need two branches for my uh, receiver. But no problem, it's pretty much the same thing. So I start with my uh, in-phase branch with cosine, and all I have to do is add to that an identical tile, another uh, receiver on top of that. And now I have an in-phase and a quadrature branch. Of course, I want this one to be cosine. This has got to be 90 degrees out of phase. It's got to be orthogonal. And so I'm going to put in a phase rotation there in my uh, receiver. And so with that, I have an I branch and a Q branch, each one sending out an electrical signal, one with the coordinate of the I and the other with the coordinate of the Q, which together gives me the symbol which was transmitted, which I've received. And I have to determine what I think was the one that was transmitted. So the coherent receiver has this three key ingredients that we talked about, and we tile it uh, in order to have both an I and a Q branch.